Well, in this first workshop, I'm going to show how to build a model of a financial system using what we call godly tables in Minsky. And uh, first of all, therefore, uh, what is Minsky? It's a way to model money, more than just money. It models uh, any dynamic system. But its specific talent is to be able to be model the monetary system as well using double entry bookkeeping tables that we call godly tables in honor of win godly so you can download it from sourceforge on that link it's open source it's free uh it will it'll run on macintoshes uh, on windows pcs and linux so there's a as usual there are problems with linux distributions i think we've got two distributions native and otherwise you've got to do your own compiling and so on and uh, installing it for those with uh, Windows and, and uh, PC should take about a minute or so. Uh, the manuals, such as they are, are on my Prof. Steve Keen website. I've got a short manual, which is a quick how-to guide, and then a long one, which is a bit of a, a companion to my last book, uh, The New Economics and Manifesto, and it's a bit of a rant on economics as well as the text, as a, a uh, manual about how to use Minsky. The best thing you can do to learn Minsky is to sign up to Tyrone Keynes' YouTube channel. Uh, Ty is somebody who came out of the blue as a maestro of using Minsky uh, with a strong background in system dynamics in general. And he puts together an excellent range of, uh, of YouTube videos that I highly recommend you watching if you want to get into modeling. And he'll be, he's a lot, uh, take, takes a lot more patience and a lot more time than I do putting a model together. Uh, and makes the model look better on top of that too. Right, so what I want to show now is how we can use Minsky to model the accounting of a mixed theatre credit economy, the economy we actually, in which we actually live. And uh, as I said, Minsky is system dynamics program and they build dynamic and non-equilibrium models of the system. Yes, you can find out what the equilibrium is, but you don't have to think you live there. So much, much more general than the uh, nonsense that neoclassicals lock themselves into all the time. Its unique feature is what we call a godly table, and that uses the accountant's method of double entry bookkeeping as a way of making sure that your model of the financial flows is, is valid. And uh, the ba basic concept is Effectively, you go from sender to recipient, record both the sender's and the recipient's view of each transaction on each line in a table. And uh, the same thing, therefore, applies to, at the aggregate, but it applies at the individual. Uh, we're, we're looking just at financial assets here. Minsky can model non-financial assets as well, which differ uh, in that the, they're an asset to the owner, but a liability to no one. Financial assets are an asset to you and a liability for somebody else. If you add the two together, you get zero. And that applies both at the individual transaction level and the aggregate. So in the aggregate, assets minus liabilities minus equity equals zero. In each transaction, the same applies. And you'll see how that lets us understand what's going on in money creation uh, when we model something in Minsky. So assets minus liabilities minus equity equals zero is an essential effect of it. It's a conservation law for monetary modeling. And we've built godly tables that they guarantee that that's correct. Well, not so much guarantee, but if you make an error, they'll show you. So let's just start building the structure of a model of financial flows in Minsky, and that's going to be the next lecture. So I was going to pop over here. This is actually uh, the previous interface for Minsky, we, uh, we now have an interface using what's called JavaScript, which looks much more like a standard Windows program. This is the one running on TCLTK, which uh, looks a bit old fashioned, people tell me. Um, the reason is that we've now got a commercial program coming called Ravel, uh, which we hope to release in the next three to six months. And that sits on top of Minsky. So, and at the moment, they can't coexist on the same computer. So if you install Ravel, it overwrites Minsky. Uh, but if you do the load Minsky from SourceForge, you'll get the more modern looking JavaScript uh, system. OK, uh, let's go through the bits and pieces. So typical story, there's this menu along the top, uh, you know, file handling, editing controls, uh, bookmarks which help organize where you are on the enormous canvas that Minsky uses, inserting all the various elements that you can also do using the widget bar down below, which most people tend to use. But that's menu access to all the various functions the program provides. Uh, options uh, controls things like whether you see values in godly tables or not. And for the moment, I'll turn that off because I'm not going to be doing any modeling here. Um, whether you use the Houghton's debit or credit or Minsky's preferred plus and minus. Uh, 
etc. I'll leave the rest. The rest aren't important. I'll get the, you, can, you can check those out for yourselves. Okay. So that's the menu. Then you have the simulation control. This will reset the system at a particular value. Uh, this is for recording uh, the actual building of a model, so don't worry about that. Going forward through a simulation, stopping it and stepping through a simulation, how fast it occurs, zooming out, zooming in, and, and getting a full screen view. And then tab. So we're going to be using the wiring tab here and the godly tab. Uh, they're different views of how you build a model. And this is the toolkit along here. So that's to load data. Uh, that's to build a Ravel, which I've said is not, not actually in the open source version. Insert a graph, spreadsheet, and over here we get uh, insert fundamental constants, uh, binary mathematical operations, unary operations, summation, uh, logical switch, a function, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We'll get I'll get to those in future workshops. But this is the one we want to look at: the Godly table. So if you click once on the icon, you'll then see a Godly table turns up in the corner over there. It becomes attached to your mouse. Click and place it on the screen, and you've now done your first step towards building. A Minsky model. When you are over it, you'll see these things which are handles to resize, uh, but don't worry about those. We use the right click menu a huge amount in the program. And I'm just going to use, first of all, to turn off this little ticked item here called display variables. I have to, you have to do, I've got to do that in every table right now, unfortunately. We're going to change that from being default to not being default, but that's getting a rid of a rather annoying, um, not quite redundant feature, but no longer necessary feature. And then I'm going to give this a title and call this the banking sector. Uh, by the way, this is the sort of this is going to be a workshop, so I hope whoever's watching this has got Minsky loaded and is following me along. In fact, I might uh, put a pause in the video earlier on to get people to actually go and do that. Okay, so there's the banking sector. Now to edit it, you left click, right right click, pardon me, and click on open godly table and that's where you'll see your assets minus liabilities minus equity view of the economy from the perspective of one particular agent in the economy so i'll make the window a bit larger leave more text there and i'm going to put on the, the typical assets that a banking the fundamental assets that a banking sector has so it's got reserves which are the deposit accounts of the private banks at the central bank they have bonds which they've bought from the a treasury or central bank and that's bonds underscore B because they're going to have banks and the central bank and uh, the private sector also owning bonds and then loans and that's the exclusive province of the banking sector the capacity to make loans which also create liabilities so that's the beginning there uh, if I was going to write a, a complicated model, model with uh, uh, workers and capitalists and firms and Etc. Etc. All separated out. I've I've put in several deposit accounts, but I'm just going to use deposits. Period. There, and I'm going to then have equity. Ah, I must have clicked the mouse keyboard wrong. Okay, okay there. Equity subscript B for banks because that's going to become very important in a moment. Uh, we look at the whole model. So, say it has reserves of 100. This is just you know totally made up numbers, obviously. Bonds of 200, let's keep on going, loans of 300, and then say deposits of 500, and the bank has equity of 100. And one important point, just to make at this moment, is that banks must have positive equity. Uh, the definition of being bankrupt for a bank is having uh, liabilities which exceed your assets, which gives you negative equity. So the banking sector has to be in positive equity. That means the rest of the, the economy has to be in negative equity with respect to the banks. Okay? And this sort of rule turns up all the time and helps you clarify whether the government should or should not run a deficit. There's our initial conditions. Now I want to start uh, putting in some operations here. And I'm going to start with the financial sector, the capacity of banks to create money. So bank lending will be the first row I put in here. And that uh, will be the flow that I'm going to call lend, meaning lend dollars per I'll call it um, no no I'll, I'll stick with separating lending and repayment out so I'll call it lend lend so lend is a flow of dollars per year trillion dollars per year billion pounds whatever uh, and that then turns up when you when the bank lends you money it puts that money in your deposit account now Minsky is currently saying well you haven't balanced this you've got to have another balancing entry 
and that is going to be just as a positive increase, which is the liability of the banking sector, the assets have increased, the loans have gone up by precisely the same amount. So that's our balancing there. Uh, it's then you also have uh, interest payments. They're going to go from the deposit accounts of the uh, uh, public. I'll just say, just go, just under, the underscore key, by the way, tells Minsky to uh, subscript the next character. So that's interest on loans, and that increases the short-term equity of the banking sector. This is money the banks can then use to spend themselves. So that's interest payments. Then you have a debt repayment. That is going to be money that is taken out of the, uh, I'll just call it repay actually, taken out of the deposit accounts. And what it effectively is is saying, I'll let you reduce my deposit account if you match me in reducing my debt. That's what's going on there. It's not actually a transfer, but that's, that's what's going on. So that's the basics of how banks create money. If the flow of lend per year is greater than the flow of repay per year, the banks will be creating money because what's happened is they've increased their, depo their uh, deposits and fundamentally the deposit of the banking sector is the money supply. All right, so that's, that's the uh, just looking at the banking sector's view and what the banking sector itself does. But the banking sector is also the conduit by which the federal government interacts with us with us for government spending and, and um, taxation. So I'll call this government spending, and that means that spend, I call this spend underscore G for uh, government, spend dollars per year turns up in your deposit accounts. When the government spends, that's what it does. It puts money in your deposit accounts. Now, how does it balance? Well, doesn't increase the debt you owe, and that's extremely important. It doesn't increase the bonds the banks own, it increases the reserves. So it's done by crediting the reserve accounts of the banks, the private banks at the central bank, because they, along with the government, share bank accounts at the uh, central bank. So it's spend underscore G, and that is now balanced. So government spending increases the money in supply in the private sector, which is something that is missed out by most people who are so worried about government spending more than they take back in taxation. So now we have taxation, and that is the opposite. That is the deduction. So tax is taken out of your deposit account, and it's also taken out of the reserve accounts of the banking sector. So important point there uh, is that, as you can see, if government spending exceeds taxation, that creates deposits, which are money you and I use for spending. It equally creates reserves, which are funds that the banks cannot use for spending, but they can use for other activities. What banks can actually do with their assets is limited by the legislation that lets you become a bank. So you can't go out and do the wild sort of speculation we see in the non-bank financial sector. Uh, so they've, they've largely limited to buying government bonds, buying them. There's other things they can buy, but it's, it's quite limited and quite tight. So fundamentally, these are funds. So it's, money is something you can spend whatever you want to spend it on. Okay? Funds, are money which is, is just, funds are things which have been allocated that enable you to buy specific things, but not others. So what can you buy if the government's created reserves for you? What can you spend them on? The answer is you can spend them on treasury bonds. Now, a point that confuses a lot of people uh, is that what the government does on a regular basis is sell bonds. And to most people, that looks like the government borrowing money. In other words, it didn't do the bond sales, it couldn't do the spending. The opposite is the case. Uh, if you go, I'll go back to the ab initio issue. When a, a, a fiat currency is, first comes into existence, so it's a military conflict or whatever else, or um, uh, the, the, like the, the greenback and the formation of the American currency and so on. Uh, when that's done and you've got a currency, you simply can't borrow your own notes from the people you haven't spent it on yet. So the initial creation has to come from the government side. Then when you look at the dynamics, and I'll, I'll go through this in a subsequent model when I actually do simulate the system, the actions of the government in running a deficit maintain a positive level of reserves for the banking sector. 
and that is what enables them to do this spending. Because, again, we're seeing this not quite in continuous time, but the government is doing these bond issues very regularly, bond sales very regularly, and the flow that is involved in that difference never or very, very rarely drives this into negative. When it does, there are mechanisms to cover it on a daily basis and so on. Most of the time, nowhere near it, and at the moment, with the huge amount of reserves that banks currently have, absolutely, totally out of the question, because... The amount of reserves, for example, in the Canadian data, which I had to look at for reasons of um, taking on somebody who thought they knew what they were talking about in banking and didn't. Um, looking at that, the reserves are equivalent to two years of the government's deficit at the moment. So this is to be balanced on a virtually a weekly basis, maybe even faster. So 1 52nd of, of the total government deficit will be uh, covered by bond issues every week. And that is nowhere near enough to turn the uh, amount in the account here, which is, in, this, in the Canadian case, twice the annual deficit, won't even touch it. So this is a mechanism which mops up what's going on with the uh, reserves matching the creation of deposits through government spending. Uh, there's not a limitation. It's, it's effectively a requirement for the government to wish those bonds and that what it has no effect on the government's money creation capability. All it does, and you'll see this when I put in the next couple of tables, all it does is make sure that the government's account at the central bank doesn't go negative. That's its role. Now, I've long-winded there, my apologies, but that's uh, a bit of explanation. Now, Treasury bond sales also mean Treasury, so interest on bonds is also necessary. So I've got to include those two. So Treasury bond sales increase the monetary value of bonds held by the uh, private banks. Uh, so what I'm showing is bond subscript T, upper uh, superscript B, sends sales by bonds by Treasury to banks. Now, that means that monetary value goes up. How's it paid for? It comes out of here. So the funds that have been created by the government deficit are then used to purchase the bonds. And the bonds are equal not just to the, um, the deficit, but also the deficit plus interest on existing bonds. So let's just now include that. That's, that is credited interest on existing bonds to banks is credited to the um, reserve accounts of the banks. And that then is another way that the equity of the private banking sector is increased. And the bonds that are issued are equal to spending minus taxation plus interest on existing bonds. And we'll see that when we start modelling the whole system uh, later on. So that's uh, the basics. I could include... Oh, I might as well see because I'm not going to try to model this one. I'll try to model a simpler model later. Um, banks sell... Bank, uh, so bond sales to non-banks... And this is a major part of what banks actually do. And what happens is, if they're going to sell the bonds they've got, then the monetary value of their bonds have to go down. And what I'm showing now with the formatting I've done there, I'll come back inside and click it in a moment, I'm saying bond sales by banks to non-banks. And to get the two characters superscripted up there, um, I had to type... Uh, curly brackets around the N and the B. Sorry, the text formatting makes it hard to see, but I'll, I'll do it more slowly in the, when I match it on the other side. So that's increased uh, the bonds owned by non-banks. That's been paid for out of the deposit accounts of the non-bank financial institutions who do most of this buying at the private banks. So NNBFI can't have an account at the central bank, therefore it has accounts at the private banks. So what we're doing is so that they're going to put that account down. And I do superscript curly brackets NB, and that's just put in uppercase everything within the curly brackets. So that's bond sales to non-banks. I've now got to include interest on bonds again. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, to NBs. Okay. And that is going to credit the deposit accounts. So the reason that people the bank the um, uh, non-banks have, purchase, have um, um, purchased the bonds is to gain the 
interesting come as well of course speculative trading that's interesting to, uh, actually I'll bet I'll make that the same follow the same sequence so interest on bonds so pardon me we've got to go back and edit that line a bit interest on bonds to non-banks so this is just trying to follow some sort of standard and how I lay these things out okay now I have interest subscript B superscript curly brackets NB close curly brackets boom okay so that's now pretty much covered everything oh except I haven't got any spending by the financial sector so of course the banks um, the banks spend you know they pay wages they pay for the habits of their staff etc etc um, I'm just going to have say spend by banks which is going to be a flow that goes into deposit accounts so that now gives me a, a closed model in the sense of their inflows and outflows out of each column you'll notice the inflows are in red the outflow sorry in blue and in black the, the um, outflows are in red um, when there's something that's on the liabilities and equity side there'll be a minus and a plus when there's something on the assets in, in, in the one row when there's uh, something on the assets and liability side it'll be either only plus or only negative and that's the essential point in terms of the creation of money by banks as well um, to increase the amount of money in existence you have to fundamentally increase the liabilities of the banking sector to increase those you have to also increase the assets so that the creation of assets by the banking sector that expands that creates and expands the money supply but from the point of view the private banking sector okay that's fairly complete but we ain't finished yet because what Minsky can also do is let you look at the uh, banking sector from the point of view of other sectors as well so let's now just take a look at the public just to do this probably the simplest one here this is now going to be the accounts that the, uh, the private sector would cost deposits of the asset they have liability is loans and we now have the equity uh, I'll call it NB no I'll call it public P for public and now with the numbers I've put in there so far of course I've, I've got them uh, having deposits as one asset but they've also I've made it possible for bonds to be owned by non-banks so we've got to make space for that and now if you see what I've got uh, let's just zoom in a bit the scroll key zooms in as well as the plus and minus keys up there I've got bond sales to non-banks well the monetary value of the deposits has gone down but the monetary value of their bond holdings goes up so we now do bonds sold by banks to non-banks as a flow whoops and I've made a mistake I typed a minus key didn't I okay that's Minsky making sure that I don't make a mistake so just delete the minus key and there's the transaction we just added the sale of bonds by banks to non-banks so this is the integrated view that, that Minsky gives you overall and let's say the current value of those is say uh, I'll, make, I'll make it so uh, 400 okay so in that case the deposits of the non-banking non public is 500 uh, the, the, the bonds holding a 400 loans are 300 equity therefore is 600 and now we have to put the other operations in here and in this case interest on bonds uh, paid to non-banks increases the equity of the uh, public uh, interest payments to the banks reduce the equity of the public government spending uh, spending by banks increases the equity of the public the non-bank public and this is the crucial one for the role of the government if government spending whoops that's G not B uh, exceeds taxation pardon me minus key then if government spending exceeds taxation then the government is creating money for the private sector it's not borrowing from the private sector it's creating money for it and that's of course probably the biggest fallacy in economics which is what MMT people have been screaming about for ages this just shows the accounting behind that absolutely valid statement so there we have banking sector and public now let's take a look at the central bank I hope people are keeping up with me here I'm after 
Uh, I normally speed up videos when I watch them, but I imagine this one will have to be slowed down for anybody who's trying to reproduce them, this themselves as we go. Okay, so central bank. And now let's take a look at its godly table. I may well miss a step here, by the way, but Minsky will actually make it obvious to me that I have. So I'm not too worried. Uh, so click for assets. No assets would haven't been allocated yet. What about liabilities? Well, we have reserves, bonds as well, but bonds are issued by the Treasury, not issued by the central bank. So reserves are a liability of the, um, of the banking sector. And now I have realized something I've left out. They have to have bonds that are owned by the central bank, which uh, to include that in here. Then what I have to include on the other godly table, I'm not going to alt tab across to the one for the banking sector. So what I left out of this one was, um, okay, bond purchases by the central bank. So it's going to make an extra row here and central bank bond, uh, bond purchase. I didn't want to make it that long, but anyway, stuck with it. Okay. So that is going to reduce the monetary value of the bonds held by the private banks. So this is held by banks to the curly bracket CB, close curly brackets. And that therefore is going to increase the reserves. And that's an important point, by the way, uh, because that's where a large part of reserve creation comes from. Uh, even if the government is trying to run a surplus, it is still having to pay interest payments, and that is a major source for reserve creation, which enables the banks to buy the bonds and means the government never needs to worry about whether there'll be people out there with money who wants it. So long as the interest rate on bonds exceeds the interest rate on reserves, it's a no-brainer for the uh, private banks to do the purchase. But in the opposite direction, when the central bank buys bonds off the uh, private banks, there are other mechanics going on. And we, having done that, we come back to this table, and now we see that that fall in um, the liabilities of the, um, hang on, where have I got that? That's actually down the bottom here, pardon me. I uh, might move that up to the top since I'm talking about it. So you click on those arrows on the other side and you move one at a time. So central bond purchases create bonds that are now owned by the, by the central bank. And let's give those a value of, say, 300. Then I can have the equity of the central bank being 200. All right. Now we've left out one liability, one very important liability from here, and that's the Treasury. And let's say the Treasury has got initially, say, 50 inside its um, liabilities then the equity of the central bank is actually 150. I'll make it 100, just round numbers, because we're going to be doing some, pointing out some mathematics, very simple arithmetic, that make important points at the end of this. So there's the um, initial conditions, uh, bond sales. Now when the treasury sells bonds, um, then it gets funds which are transferred to its treasury account. And that's the essential, ah, oh, pardon me, again, I typed a minus, but I shouldn't have done so. Um, that's the essential inflow. That means the Treasury's account could be kept positive so long as it's greater than the sum of the uh, next uh, four elements. So interest on bonds is going to take money out of the Treasury account and pay it to the banks and go through the reserve accounts to do it. Spending is going to decrease the amount of money in the government's or the funds in the government's account at the central bank. Interest payments on bonds to non-banks. Uh, deduct money from the account and tax increases the amount in the account. So uh, we now have a fairly comprehensive view. Let's just uh, take a look at the whole thing together. Just make sure I've got everything Work down. That's using the Godly Tables tab over here. So you click on that tab, you'll now see a nice old mess where the all all the tables are superimposed over each other. But you can take a look around and realise that I've left one thing out. I'm wondering, ah, huh. hang on, public. Yep, okay. I've left out the Treasury, haven't I? Okay. Let's go back. Pardon me, getting ahead of myself. 
So right click, turn off that display of variables thing again. We'll fix it up as a get that rid of rid of that as a default in one of the next betas. Treasury, label it, open their godly table, and now it's operations. And this is where we see where money creation actually occurs from the point of view of the of the government sector. So I think I've mentioned the role of the down arrow. I may have jumped over that. By the way, the reason I'm using headphones here is because my microphone picked up every last tap when I tried to run the last thing. I was, the whole video was ruined by tap, tap, tap every time I timed a key because my microphone sits on a stand while I'm traveling. I don't have a, a boom for it. So that's why uh, I'm wearing these headphones. Okay, so if I haven't said it before, the down arrow says go and look for a liability that has been allocated. If you click on the down arrow in assets, or go and look for an asset that has been allocated if you click in the wedge for liability. And then multiple equity color columns are used to match across the non-financial assets, but that's not an issue for this video. So click here and see what, what assets haven't currently yet, what liabilities elsewhere haven't yet been allocated as assets, and that's just the Treasury's account at the central bank. So click Treasury there, and then all those operations come across. Now what liabilities are yet to be allocated? Bonds owned by the banks. One more column, press the plus key. Bonds owned by the non-banks, another plus key. Bonds owned, uh, down arrow key, the plus key followed by wedge. Bonds owned by the central bank. And now you've got almost everything included in there. But one of the most important points is here we're going to have the treasury, equ equity of the treasury. And notice that is negative. And it has to be. Whoops, not quite that negative. Um, because if, if to balance the whole system, I said because one person's asset is another person's liability, every person's assets minus liabilities equals their equity, the sum of all equity ends up being zero. So if we are any, if the non-government sector is going to be in positive equity, the government has to be in negative equity. That's absolutely essential. So if you believe your goal in life is to drive the equity of the government up to zero, what you're saying is you want to drive the equity of the public down to zero, which I think is the opposite of what particularly Tory prime, uh, members of parliament might wish to achieve. So the standard belief that everybody has is literally as wrong as the Ptolemaic vision of the universe was. Now, anybody today who believes that the Earth is the centre of the universe and that planets and moon and stars and suns rotate around it on centric spheres belongs in a lunatic asylum. Unfortunately, people who believe that the government has to borrow from the public are in Parliament. We have a problem. OK, let's finish this off. So interest on bonds is a negative for the equity of the, government, of the Treasury. So interest payments... Uh, on bonds to banks reduces the equity of the government. This is where the negativity comes from. Interest on bonds to non-banks. Government spending. And taxation makes the equity less negative. But unless that equity is negative, there is no government money creation going on and the rest of the economy is therefore in well, zero equity, so if the government actually got us up to have no debt, then matching, and again, I'm abstracting from foreign uh, transactions here, this is looking just at a, a single uh, economy view. But if the government got its equity to zero, all the money in the economy would be credit created money. The equity of the uh, government would be zero, the equity of the non-government would be zero. Because the banking sector must be in positive equity, the non-bank public would be in negative equity. So that is the ambition of people who wish to reduce government debt, is to put the non-bank public into negative equity. Not what I think you think you're doing. All right, so we now have, I think, a complete view. Let's go take a look at the godly tables. And now we have, I'll put the treasury over here. And now I can, actually, whatever. It's confusing to how to allow these tables out. So. Notice the equity of the banking sector is 100. The equity of the public is 600. So the total of the non-government sector is 700. The equity of the central bank is 100. Minus 800 for the treasury gives you a minus 700. So the equity of the government sector 
The negative of that is the equity of the public, the, private, the, the non government sector. So if you want the non government sector to be in positive equity, you actually want the government to be in negative equity. You also have, uh, as you can see, the, the flows cancel out. What changes the equity of the non bank public is the sum of interest on bonds plus spending minus taxation. So the bigger that gap is, the more equity the public, sec the, the public are in with regard to the government. Um, so all those you know, worries about bankrupting yourself because you're, you can't do that. You can overinflate yourself, but you can't bankrupt yourself by creating government money. In fact, if you don't create enough government money, you're likely to see the private sector going crazy on borrowing uh, to get money to speculate and gamble on the value of financial assets. So what is seen as responsible finance is we'd be like a Ptolemaic version of responsible rocketry. Okay? Doesn't happen. You have to see this from the point of view of an integrated view of the entire financial sector and then what you think you've understood by looking at the government, you will see is completely wrong. Okay, that's a, what Minsky can teach you without doing the modelling. So what I'll do in the next workshop with a simpler model uh, and just to show the role of, um, of banks and money creation and what the macroeconomic impact is that is, uh, I'll just use a, a much simpler model than that to do it. But that is without even doing the modelling, you can learn a huge amount from Minsky and I wish people who are involved in um, arguing about money would download Minsky and start arguing and check their logic just in case they make a mistake. So that's just going to be, uh, that's a mixed credit fiat economy. Let's call that, uh, uh, oh, that'll do. I'm going to do uh, other, other than the models later. Okay, so that's the first one. Next workshop, um, I'll release in a couple of days' time.